All right, good morning, everybody in the US and buonasera in Italy. Um, today, we have a wonderful guest with us, and that is Agnes Crawford uh, from Understanding Rome. She is a local tour guide in Rome and really extraordinary. I mean, she does such interesting walks. I love going around <clears throat> with Agnes to see things I've never even seen before. And I've seen, I've been in Rome for 25 years and she can take me, me and show me places I've never even heard of. So that's a pretty, she's got an, an encyclopedic knowledge of Roman history. So welcome Agnes, how are you tonight? Very well, well thank you for that uh, delightful introduction. It's very nice to, uh, very nice to see you. And uh, it's a sort of slightly muggy evening here in Rome, slightly gray skies as perhaps you can see, but uh, Fingers crossed. I'm under an umbrella, so I think we should be all right. So I hear that it's been really bad weather in Italy this this spring. It's been sort of toing and froing, toing and froing. There've been some. I mean, well, in the in the north, up in the north, there've been absolutely disastrous floods. Um, in Rome, it's just been sort of slightly dispiritingly damp. But we've had we've had our fair share of blue skies. This morning was summer. This afternoon, not. Uh, <laughs> so we're getting there. Yeah, we've had the opposite. I think we have your weather here in Seattle. It's been sunny and really nice, which has never well, happened. So. Glad to hear <laughs> it. Thank glad you. Glad to hear it. Thank you for You're sending welcome. your weather our way. Um, so right now I have been hearing that Rome is absolutely slammed. How's that? How's it going as a guide? So it's um, it's certainly extremely busy, um, but uh, as is often the case, everybody is in the same places. So there are plenty of uh, plenty of places which are not heaving at all. Yesterday, I took three lots of people on three different tours and we barely saw a soul. Um, and we saw extraordinary places, Appian Way, aqueducts, the Baths of Caracalla. We walked through churches in Trastevere, different people this uh, second tour, churches in Trastevere, around the Tiber Island um, and had, you know, sort of blissfully peaceful and incredibly beautiful places to ourselves. And then uh, I had a, a group of people uh, for a, a the evening visit of the uh, Borghese in the last slot just before it closed. And that was also pretty much just for us. So um, what with one thing and another, one can certainly avoid the crowds. I would say, obviously, when visiting Rome, people, of course, want to see the Vatican and the Colosseum and the uh, uh, Trevi Fountain. But I would say with a bit of strategic timing, those are doable. Nobody needs to see the Trevi Fountain at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, it looks absolutely wonderful at all hours of the day and night. So very early and very late, I can highly recommend. Um, Colosseum uh, reservations are tricky, but generally speaking, that works pretty well. And the Vatican Museums is, I'm afraid, absolute mayhem at the moment. Uh, but um, uh, there, are, um, uh, there are sort of strategic timing options to minimise it. I would also say it's worth bearing in mind, I think there's nothing that anybody has to see. I think, you know, if, if somebody really wants to visit the Sistine Chapel, fantastic, go for it. You'll be there with 30,000 other people. Um, if, however, uh, it's something that perhaps you feel you ought to see, but it's not necessarily top of your personal list, I give you absolute absolution. Uh, don't go, you don't have to. Yes, to, I know. This is our job. Honestly, yeah. I think this is something that we need to really start letting people know because I, I, I've seen you struggle with getting even tickets to the Coliseum and you are a guide and you have a lot of access to things other people don't. And the Vatican Museum, personally, just I'm going to say it. I, oh, cheers. Yes. This is coffee. <laughs> oh, cheers. <laughs> Negroni. This is, this, is a, this is a, a Campari spritz. A Negroni is a little, a little strong for me. Mm. But the thing I think is interesting is that... Um, the Vatican Museum, I find to be kind of unsafe at the hours most people go because it's so overcrowded. And people mm -hmm. tell themselves, well, I'm going to see those things because those are the things everybody sees. But really, it, unless you've been reading about Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel for a long time, and it's something that really fascinates you, okay, well, then that makes sense. But if you're just a casual traveler who's visiting, who doesn't really have a big thing for art, I don't know. I think that it is good for that everybody to be absolved of the requirement to see that stuff, right? I mean, absolutely. I mean, I was there uh, a couple of days ago and a couple of days ago and a day before that as well. And we were there in the afternoon and I have all the timings and I know exactly the ways of doing it. And we minimize the chaos. Absolutely. Plus, I was with small groups, two people, four people. And we could, you know, um, shimmy in and out of the larger uh, tour groups. Um, but even so, even with 20, 
two years of tricks up my sleeve. Um, you know, there's only so much one can do. Um, certainly, I would say at the moment, visiting it, you know, sort of on your own, it's, it's just a shuffle from beginning to end. Um, and I don't mean to put people off. As, again, as you say, if people have absolutely always wanted to see it, fantastic. Yeah. But as I say, I think, I think there's, it's also worth bearing in mind that, for example, Palazzo Barberini has one of the most extraordinary painted ceilings of the Roman Baroque. It's a wonderful palace with an extraordinary collection of paintings. And there's never anybody very much there. There's the correct number of people, a civilized number of people, where you can walk through the rooms at whatever speed you like, and you can stand as long as you like in front of any of the paintings. They even have deck chairs in the main hall at the moment so that you can admire the ceiling while sitting down, which is uh, rather a splendid idea. I would also recommend the Palazzo Doria Pamfili or the Capitoline Museums. The Capitoline Museums is one of the finest museums in the world. And it is undervisited because there are so many amazing things in Rome. Well, um, I, and people. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, please. No, and sorry, and our visitors obviously only have a certain amount of time. Yeah. So it's clear that uh, you know certain places will be slightly less visited, but these are world class, extraordinary sites, which you can have to yourself at the moment when Rome is possibly busier than I've ever seen it. Do you really think that? You think it's busier than you've ever seen it? I think definitely post lockdown, the uh, people, uh, you know, all of us have been yearning to travel. And uh, uh, once we've been uh, sort of, uh, you know, got the, the, the bit in our teeth, of course, uh, everybody's uh, uh, traveling quite rightly. And it's a, um, you know, a, a wonderful thing. It's great seeing, uh, um, you know, so many uh, folk around. But it's, um, again, often concentrated in the same places. I don't think there is a bad time to visit Rome at all. Okay. I think there are just bad ways of doing it. I like that. Not a bad time, but not, but lots of bad ways. Well, I think that um, my, my observation doing the Vatican Museum for like 20 years is that they should have a checkpoint at the door of the Sistine Chapel. And that checkpoint should have a guard that interviews each person and says, what city are you in? And what are you about to see? And if you can't answer those questions, you're not allowed to go in. <laughs> because well, I, honestly, I would say most people that wander through there, they look like they don't even know what day it is, much less even know what I mean, they're looking at. To, to, to be fair at the moment, uh, even I, by the time I enter the Sistian Chapel, sometimes don't know where I am and what day it is. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's an understandable understandable reaction I think um but uh yeah I mean I think uh, I don't think people should be put off by crowds at all I think uh, they should just perhaps think a little bit about what it is they really want to see and how they're going to do it I think that's the really the best way to look at it is you have to be really honest with yourself about what are you interested in and what is your travel party interested in like if you have always wanted to see a Sistine Chapel great but if that you just want to go to Rome and that's at the top of the list of things that people tell you you should see Maybe instead think, well, I actually like contemporary art more, or I actually prefer, you know, looking at, you know, houses and like the interiors of no noble homes, or maybe I'm just interested in food, you know, that's okay. It really is. Absolutely. Walk yeah. through neighborhoods, have a spritz in a piazza. I think also I would really heavily suggest, um, you know, because when people are uh, booking tours, um, we are the masters of, of the opposite of upselling, downselling. Take fewer tours. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. <laughs> spend less. Spend less money, um, because um, because I think one significant thing a day is the correct way of doing it, and not every day necessarily has to have a significant thing because that gives one the opportunity to have a wander and an explore and think, well, this looks quite nice. Let's sit down here and have a coffee or a drink or a lunch that lasts longer than we might otherwise have done, because that too is also a way of absorbing. Uh, the city so um, I definitely think uh, you know a vacation is a vacation and uh, that's also something to to bear in mind it's not a death march it shouldn't be it shouldn't feel like a death march ever it, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be <laughs> I think too many times when people go to Italy they feel like they have to get like an education while they're there and really I don't think any Italian would ever look at travel in Italy that way do you no and I think but, but, but I think you know the same when I travel abroad, whenever one goes somewhere new, it's all an education. I mean, it's all incredibly interesting because places are different. So every aspect of places, you don't have to necessarily 
be in a museum or an archaeological site, you can go for a walk through the Villa Borghese on a Sunday afternoon and see the kids playing on their bikes. And that's also just a, uh, an anthropological education also. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it absolutely is. Especially just learning the fact that, you know, people use the Villa Borghese like their yard because they don't have yards, right? So they teach their kids to ride bicycles there, for example. So I think that that's a nice thing to see. And what better yard could one have? <laughs> <laughs> they have the most beautiful yard in the world. Hey, so if anybody's just joining us now, um, I'm joined here by Agnes Crawford, who is a local tour guide in Rome, giving us tips and tricks for traveling in Rome, which is insane right now. I do have my eye on questions. I have them queued up. So if you guys have any comments or questions, go ahead and put them into the chat and I will ask her. The first question is, where is she? And she is sitting in one of my favorite squares in all of Rome, right? Yeah, this is uh, one of my favorites as well. This is Piazza Farnese. Uh, so this is just off the Campo dei Fiori. There are lots of bars in the Campo dei Fiori, but I thought I'd uh, come over here because it's a little quieter. Um, and Piazza Farnese, the building behind me, which is partially under scaffolding. There is a sort of perpetual restoration work underway everywhere. Um, this is uh, Palazzo Farnese, which is a project that Michelangelo was one of the major architects. He took over the project when he was 71 years old and it sort of leaves a lasting mark on the design of the palace for Pope Paul III of the Farnese family. It's now the French embassy. Um, and oh, there's the umbrella. There's, uh, there's my spritz and the snacks. You also get you also get snacks in Italy. People are very keen on snacks with drinks, and quite wise too. And then immediately behind me, if you can see the fountain, that's a fountain. Looks like a great big grey bathtub. Do you see that tap just behind the uh, post? Um, that's a bath that came from the Baths of Caracalla, um, which is uh, the second largest bath complex that was ever built in the Roman world, um, and it's the most intact i mean spoiler it is in ruins there's no water there um but i was in fact there with pope yesterday morning wonderful place uh vast structure which once again we had almost to ourselves um and the baths of caracalla uh were sort of cannibalized by the farnese family in the 1500s so statues were put in the palace bathtubs turned into fountains in their piazza um and uh one sees this again and again the sort of repurposing of elements of the ancient city in the renaissance city so even sitting here having a spritz you know one could uh, perfectly happily uh, absorb both ancient and renaissance history um from a comfortable seated position with refreshments so there i have a new idea for you agnes for your business and it should be aperitivo with agnes where people come and their tour is just sitting somewhere cool <laughs> and you just talk <laughs> That's not a bad idea. I might take you up on that. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that would be so fun. Just have people come and like sit, sit at a big table and you just sort of talk at everything that they can see. And that is actually the thing I think is really magnificent about your style of guiding, because I think you and I kind of have a similar vibe, which is, you know, I don't have a plan when I go out. When I have my groups with me, I know vaguely where I'm going, but and I kind of know what's along the way, but it's the delight in Rome of just being distracted by something. You're like, oh, I have a great story about this building over here, you know? And that's, I think you, I don't know if any other city in the world you can do that exact thing, right? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I have uh, sort of suggested itineraries, um, you know, for tours um, to give people a bit of an idea, but none of it is, you know, written in stone, so to speak. I mean, obviously if we go to the Vatican Museums, we're going to see the Sistine Chapel and St. Peter's. If we go to, uh, um, you know, the, the Forum and the Palatine and the Colosseum, we're going to go inside the Colosseum, that sort of thing. But for example, I honestly don't think in 22 years I've ever taken exactly the same route twice. Uh, so doing tours, particularly in the center of the city, the Field of Mars area, uh, Trastevere, um, the routes are just infinite. This church is open today. You know, let's pop in there and have a look. This uh, courtyard has a nice cafe in it. Would you like a cup of coffee? You know, I mean, there are, there are umpteen, um, you know, variables, which is what makes it interesting. And also walking around, talking to people, Perhaps one thing comes up as something that people are more interested in than something else. And so you focus on that. So that's absolutely something that makes my life uh, much more interesting. As, as you say, there's absolutely no need uh, to be doing a sort of by rote um, tour. And I find, I mean, and again, this summer, it will be 22 years that I've been giving tours in Rome. Um, I don't think a day has gone by where I haven't seen something I didn't notice before. So there's a great deal of kind of constant excitement in the discovery 
of the city and piecing together this sort of wonderfully complex sort of four-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, and I just love the fact that we can, like when you and I did a tour recently, when we did the Rome tour, we had a plan in the morning and then we just sort of changed it around as we went because it's like, oh, you know, I think this other church might be open. Oh, wait, that door's open. Let's go in there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, the important thing is obviously, you know, I'm a professional. When you promise things to people, you make sure that they see them. But the extras can be absolutely variable just depending on on what uh, what pops up. And uh, absolutely, as you say, that's what keeps it really, really, really sort of exciting and interesting. Yeah. Well, I think that just walking around and, and looking, I mean, if, if I were to plan the perfect day in Rome, personally, I would absolutely not go to the Vatican Museum or the Forum or, and, or go to, you know, the Colosseum. I would just walk. That's my favorite way to spend a day in Rome. I would walk probably from the Circus Maximus, maybe up to Piazza del Popolo, something like that, and just see where the day takes me. Like, that's what yeah, I would that, do with my time. That's a great thing. I mean, another thing uh, I might mention is, you know, the Colosseum, for example, uh, is a very complicated booking system at the moment because limited numbers, and there can be, you know, queues on the day and that sort of thing. But the Palatine Hill and the Roman Forum, one can buy an open ticket. That's 30 acres. The Palatine Hill is one of my favorite places in the world. It's the site of the foundation of Rome. It has the ruins of the Imperial Palace. It had a Renaissance botanical garden. It's extremely bucolic. And one, again, never take the same route up there. There's so much to see. Um, and one can happily wander around there at the moment while the world and his wife are milling around down by the Colosseum, you can wander around there and feel as if, you know, one were the grand tourists of the 18th century, because uh, there really is no uh, great crowds. You get fantastic view from the Palatine Hill over the Roman Forum. Uh, and the area of the Forum itself is also, you know, a really large and really rich and interesting area. And one of my favorite things to do is to go in at one side, pop out the other, rule number one in tour guide school, as you know, is never retrace your steps. Um, yeah. And also from, here's a top tip for your followers, uh, from uh, um, the Temple of Venus in the area of the Forum complex, you get the best view of the exterior of the Colosseum. Oh, that's and true. So, that's and true. so, I mean, not I going inside the Colosseum is not necessarily something that one has to beat oneself up about, I think. It's again, it depends on what's top of your list. Yeah, well, and I, I remember for years when I was a student, the Coliseum wasn't even open at the time, and we never really got to go in, and I never felt like I missed anything, because I could go and walk around it, and you know, you can see it from every side, and yeah, the interior is fun, the underground tour is fun, but I think you just gave us like the million dollar tip right there, which I so agree with, is that yeah, you can sit for hours trying to find yourself tickets and bend yourself into knots trying to get to fit a visit to the Coliseum, and you and two million of your best friends, Whereas you have this wonderful idea, just buy a ticket anytime. You don't even have to plan ahead. Buy a ticket online for the Palatine and the Forum and just go in when you feel like it. Like that's an amazing tip right there because the thing I don't care for about the way Rome is these days versus I'm an old timer too. Like when I studied there in the nineties or when I started tour guiding 23 years ago, I love that the city was like a, a playground. It was just fun. And I think the fun has kind of been sucked out of some of those things that need so much preparation to go to, you know what I mean? But again, there's a lot of fun there. There's a lot of excitement there. There's a lot of um, sort of still kind of, you know, places with an air of mystery that you don't find perhaps if you feel that you're perhaps being herded around somewhere a little bit, which is not a nice feeling. So um, yeah, I would say, I would suggest that people think really hard about their itineraries and what it is that they really want to see, or even if it's not something they really want to see, but what's the kind of idea that they're looking for? Um, you know, if you're interested in archaeological sites, go to the Bards of Caracalla, get the virtual reality headset that they do there. That's super fun. 
Yeah. Well, I love that you actually have more like theme tours too, which is something interesting. Like you would do a waterworks tour. Like how did the water in Rome work? Where did it come from? Like that's something really original. And if you're with, let's say you're with an engineer, like let's say your partner is an engineer, they're going to be way more into that than they are into the Vatican Museum. I can, I'm, I'm going to guess. Absolutely. I've taken hydraulic engineers out to, um, to look at the aqueducts, I did a tour called Roads and Water, which is I, which I was with Pope doing yesterday, which again never has an absolute fixed itinerary, but has certain things that we look at. And we were looking at a section of aqueducts, incredibly impressive arches. There's a photo on my Instagram, Understanding Rome, if anyone wants to take a look uh, from yesterday. Um, and it's a hundred feet tall and stretches off into the distance amid, at the moment, poppies and wild flowers. And we saw, I kid you not, not one other person, not one. <laughs> oh, there was a guy, wait, there was a guy jogging past when we were going back to the driver, um, but that was it. So, um, and that is for me, one of the most extraordinary sites in Rome. Yeah. And yet hydraulic engineers in the past have found me because they Google aqueduct tour Rome. And I'm just a you know small time um, little business, but uh, that's what crops up because not a lot of people do tours of these places. Yeah. Well, and I think that you, you're really good at looking for different angles on how to see Rome. And that's the thing is that Rome can be seen from so many different angles. You could talk about the reunification of Italy in that time period. You can talk about the Renaissance. You can talk about the Baroque time. You can talk about the famous papal families. You can talk about, I mean, there's really any anything you could be potentially interested in, you could probably put a tour together for, right? Absolutely. And there's not a, there's not a period of history that isn't represented. I mean, it's not called the eternal city for nothing. So absolutely from, you know, the birth of Rome and the legends of Romulus and classical antiquity, uh, for example, the Eur district was built during the fascist period. So that's a very interesting area to visit for the uh, um, 20th century history of Rome. I want to do that with you sometime. I've done that once with the group and we had a local architectural like enthusiast group take us around but I want to hear your angle on that because I love a or I, I mean that's I'm an architect so of course that that speaks to me but you know it's, but a, it's an incredibly interesting area it's best visited I always like uh, if I am taking people there ideally on a Sunday because it's a business district so on a Sunday it's very quiet yeah which adds to this sort of slightly you know slightly uh de Chirico air there's a painter called de Chirico from uh uh well he, was, he lived a very long life, so he's from pretty much every part of the 20th century. Um, and he paints these uh, several metaphysical paintings with these sort of slightly weird dreamlike landscapes and vast buildings. And it, on a Sunday, it's, uh, it's got a definite De Chirico vibe. It does. Well, and Fellini used that as the backdrop for like a 10 story tall Anita Ekberg, you know, this kind of weird surrealist sort of film. I mean, it's the perfect place if you like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Surreal. It's so oh, it's Fellini central. Yes. Yeah, it is. Hey, I've got a question here for you. Um, do you ever do tours um, focusing on uh, the history of, of the Jews in Rome, like the ghetto? Ab abso yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think absolutely the Jewish history of the city is incredibly interesting it goes back to the second century BC so the first um, uh, Jews who came to Rome came as ambassadors from Judas Maccabeus in uh, about 169 BC during the time of the Roman Republic so the Roman Jewish community predates the diaspora um, after the sack of Jerusalem in the year 70 and the destruction of the temple so it is neither Ashkenazi nor Sephardic it's a very um, uh, intriguing uh, and very ancient um, community and very ancient rite of service and the area of the Jewish quarter uh, as it's now called had been uh, between 1555 and 1870 it was walled in and was effectively uh, a sort of controlled district a sort of semi-prison um, which as you mentioned was uh, called the ghetto uh, of Rome um, so absolutely, Jewish Rome offers a great deal of interesting sites to visit. Uh, so there's the Jewish Quarter, um, the synagogue there, uh, in Prastevere, which is where the first uh, Jews settled in the second century BC and where the Jewish community was largely resident until the 15th century. Um, but also even if one goes to the ancient port at Ostia, which is another fantastic day trip, 
and it's a really big site. But if one is prepared to make a little bit of a schlep to the furthest corner, there is the second oldest synagogue in Europe, um, which uh, survive, you know, a column survives, a menorah carved on the column survives. And it's a reminder um, of the cosmopolitan nature of the Roman Empire, uh, which of course stretched across three continents. It was most certainly not a European empire. Um, and, uh, and the port of Ostia reflects that as well. Wow, I that, I didn't know that. See, every time I talk to you, Agnes, I learn something which is impressive. And actually, it, interestingly enough, I don't think people realize that um, Rome has the most interesting Jewish community in Italy, for sure. I mean, you can eat wonderful Roman Jewish food, which Rome is actually quite famous for. But in Italy, there are quite a few historical Jewish sites. Sicily has a ton of them. There's almost no Jewish people living in Sicily anymore, although they're trying to kind of invite people to come back. But there's a lot of interesting history there and Rome as well. Not so much in Florence, a little bit in Venice. We, there is a ghetto in Venice, but I don't think people think about Italy as a place to investigate that history. No, absolutely. The uh, Palermo is um, uh, is very um, interesting, and of course, I mean the central neighbourhood of Palermo. You have street signs, uh, which are also some of them uh, written uh, in Hebrew. Um, yes, Sicily, and um, and in fact, I mean the Roman Jewish community in 1492 was added to by a Sicilian Jewish community who were amongst those under Spanish control, expelled by Ferdinand and Isabella. Um, elsewhere in uh, Italy, Venice, for example, the Jewish community was entirely, you know, almost entirely wiped out during the Second World War, which is why. So now, for example, the ghetto in Venice is largely being repopulated by largely Ashkenazi Jews coming from Israel, um, which is a, um, uh, so not a Venetian community, but a different uh, Jewish community, the Jewish uh, quarter in uh, Venice, the uh, former Jewish ghetto in Venice is another incredibly interesting place to visit, um, rather smaller than that of Rome, of course, but uh, yeah, extremely interesting and, and with a different history. Uh, of course, Venice's history is uh, gloriously interesting, but not as long as that of Rome. <laughs> I do love Venice. I mean, it is one of my favorite places, but I don't think it's as fascinating to me as Rome, just because of the fact like we've been talking about, you can look at Rome in so many different ways. You can you can find an interesting angle on it no matter what. So, and that leads me to a new project that you've got going, which is very exciting, um, which is a, a podcast that you're doing. You want to tell us a little bit about your podcast? Well, so I'm, I, I started last January, I started a Substack newsletter. So it's, um, there's a free option. Um, and then there's a subscription option, um, which uh, has posts with photographs that I don't post anywhere else. I'm very, prolific on Instagram, um, but uh, I save the best photos uh, for my sub stack. Um, and I write uh, posts about things that I find interesting. So whether it's about looking at uh, uh, popular Italian songs and seeing a bit of contemporary culture through those, um, or whether it's looking at contemporary exhibitions or whether uh, looking at um, uh, neighborhoods, um, focusing on a particular building. Uh, so it's an entirely varied um, uh, series of posts of things that interest me. On the Substack platform, I also have a monthly podcast, um, which is uh, mostly for subscribers. In fact, there are a couple of free episodes. The first one uh, and the most recent one about the Colosseum are both free for anybody to listen to. I think uh, you put links up on your Facebook page. So thank you very much for that. Um, and if people would like to have a listen and tell me what they think, uh, I would be extremely grateful. Um, and yeah, the podcast um, uh, is just called A Podcast About Rome. Um, they're pretty short, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and each one, just me speaking. Um, uh, so no uh, sort of chat, just, uh, you know, straight to the chase. Um, and uh, uh, talking about effectively the history of Rome as seen through each episode, a single building or a single artifact. Yeah. So looking at um, each of these objects or buildings, so a sculpture, a building, uh, for example, to see the sort of chronological progression of the city. Um, so uh, it began right at the beginning talking about 
uh, the Forum Warium, which is the area right by where your group was staying last yeah. time I saw yeah. you in Rome. Beautiful neighborhood to be staying in. Um, and uh, it was there that Romulus and Remus in legend were sharp and are suckled by the she wolf. Um, so uh, we talked. Uh, so uh, we talked about that on on the tour. Uh, so the podcast episode, which is one of the free ones, um, talks about uh, two temples in that area and about how the story of Romulus and Remus is an ancient legendary story, but it is built upon an even more ancient legendary story and connected to the absolute origins of the city from a non-legendary, entirely anthropological uh, perspective. So uh, absolutely, that was the first episode. And I've worked my way through looking at uh, sculptures and buildings and uh, bits of walls and all sorts of things. And so far I've got up to the late first century and the most recent episode, which is free for everybody, is about the Colosseum. Wow, that's really cool. And actually, interestingly enough, the reason I found out about her Substack was because my group, my driver got lost on the way to uh, the um, the hills outside of Rome to pl the place we were going for lunch. And we ended up at a museum that I had always heard of and I'd never seen. And it was literally in the middle of absolutely nowhere, like this random building. And I looked it up on Google Maps and I'm like, that can't be what I think that is. And we went in and we saw a museum that housed the remnants of the, the boat um, the Nero's, Nero's boat, wasn't it? Yeah. Caligula. 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 Caligula's boat. Exactly. That's one of the episodes of the podcast. <laughs> that was just so funny because we got lost. We found this museum that I'd always heard about. I was so excited to see it. I, we went in and saw the exhibition just completely randomly. And then I talked to you and you're like, oh, I just did a podcast on that. <laughs> Great minds think alike. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yes. The floating palaces of the Emperor Caligula. Uh, which were once on Lake Nemi and which were um, from the 15th century, there were projects to reveal, you know, and to bring up the remains of these boats and, uh, um, and the story of their salvation and what happened to them next is, um, is a very interesting one. Oh, and it's so sad, too, because that building is, it's actually a cool building. I mean, I like, I'm into fascist architecture from, you know, the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and it's like, what a sad thing that they built this great building. And it's actually a good exhibition space. So anyhow, you guys need to listen to her podcast to find out what happened to those boats because it's a very, very peculiar and interesting story that I, it's hard to even believe it's true. So sorry for all the pointing. As you can see, the bar is filling up and therefore I'm just donating <laughs> the chairs at the table saying, no, no, I don't need them. You're welcome to them. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I hope you can hear okay, because they've, they've got some music going. I think there's a birthday party happening as well. No, actually, your headphones are perfect. I can only hear you. So. Perfect. So, Agnes, my question for you is, what do you like to do? Like, if a client came to you and said, I don't even care, Agnes, you, t you take me and show me something cool. What would you do? Well, so, well, so most recently that happened on Sunday. Okay. Um, quite often people perhaps book a couple of slots and they have a thing they want to do and then they just want to see what else they want to do, particularly when I, I quite often see people that I've seen before. Um, so uh, we took a taxi from their hotel to the Giniculum Hill, to the fountain of the Aqua Paola, which is a spectacular 17th century fountain fed that by is. an ancient aqueduct, restored by a pope, with a brilliant view. And we meandered our way down the hill because uh, that's a nice thing. Walking down a hill is, uh, is an agreeable thing to do. Um, and we stopped off at the Tempietto of Bramante. We stopped off at some churches in Trastevere. They had a lunch appointment at the Palazzo Doria Pampini, which now has a lovely cafe restaurant in the courtyard. Um, and so we meandered our way in that direction. And uh, um, absolutely. So, you know, that was a route which I've never done before. Uh, the people I was taking around yesterday morning had asked what, what, what they might like to do, given they've been to Rome several times. And I suggested the Appian Way and the aqueducts and the baths of Caracalla, and they were absolutely delighted. I was absolutely delighted. Even the driver had fun. He said, I've never done this route before, and he'd been driving in Rome since 1999. So uh, wow. um, so uh, it was uh, a super day out, and we came across some goats as well. So, um, <laughs> yeah, there are, I mean, there are, it depends. It really, I, I like to perhaps ask people, you know, what specifically they're interested in. Um, because some people are more interested in ancient history, Renaissance history, you know, 
quieter sort of rural places or perhaps more urban areas. Uh, perhaps people are interested in visiting a neighborhood. Um, Pestach or Garbatella um, are incredibly interesting neighborhoods if one wants to get a kind of 20th century um, perspective. Um, you know, uh, there's a very interesting tour to do on public housing in the early 20th century, um, which is, uh, um, you know, full of uh, intriguing architectural gems. Um, so, yeah, I mean, absolutely inexhaustible supply of things to do. So it really depends on, depends on the time of year. It depends on the sorts of things that uh, people express more or less of an interest in. Um, but definitely my roads and water tour is one of my favorites. I mean, because it's just glorious. And again, one gets out of uh, the busier areas of the city. The Field of Mars, so that's the, where the Pantheon, Piazza Navona uh, is, but that's an area also which is so incredibly rich in both ancient ruins, um, medieval churches, Baroque palaces, um, that there are an inexhaustible number of routes. I mean, I would say that if somebody had been to Rome 20 times and had stayed in that area and explored it day in, day out, I think there's still things that they could find that they haven't seen before, because I'm still finding things that I haven't seen before. Yes, me too. And this is why I just don't understand why people always tread the same paths that bloggers or whatever tell them to do. Like, really, Rome is like a choose your own adventure situation. There's so much to do. I love how you do kind of interesting random history stuff. Like our friend Mountain, he does like churches. He can do churches till the cows come home because there's so many churches. You will never run out of churches. And the other thing that you and I, I think, share a, a passion for is the greater Rome too, because a lot of people think Rome Rome is just the centro storico you know you have to stay by the trevi fountain and it's like actually rome is a city of more than three million people but it's also a city that has an absolutely glorious periphery you know like you can go out to the seacoast you know you can go out to uh Cervetri, for example and go see the etruscan tombs out there i mean that will take you you could spend months just doing that i think that's a spectacular trip yeah I was there with some people just a couple of weeks ago. We went to the Etruscan tombs. So we went to a little museum at Cerveteri, which has two rooms. And in one of them um, is possibly the finest Greek vase of the early 6th century BC in existence, sort of 500 BC, um, which was in the Metropolitan Museum in New York until it was returned to the Italian state. They'd bought it off somebody who wasn't supposed to be selling it in the 70s. Um, and it was returned rather splendidly to the small museum close to the place from where it was taken. So it was made in Greece, brought to Italy as a status symbol for an Etruscan grandee, buried in his tomb, and then, um, you know, now is displayed a matter of kilometers from uh, the place where it was found. Um, so that small museum, the Etruscan tombs at Cervetini are spectacular. It's the most gorgeous bucolic place at the moment, full of wild flowers. And then usually when I take people there, we go uh, to the coast nearby where Cerveteri had its ancient port, the ancient port of Pirgi, where it just so happens, as well as a medieval castle, an Etruscan wall, a beautiful bit of coastline, a nice view of the sea. There's also an excellent restaurant. So, uh, you know, it's a great combination both gastronomically satisfying and um, geolog geographically and historically coherent. So Agnes, you're making me really want to put together that tour that you and I keep fantasizing about, about doing just as uh, you stay in Rome and we just do field trips every day. I really want to do that with Absolutely. you. <laughs> with great pleasure, with great pleasure. Yeah, There's because- an inexhaustible supply. Tivoli sure. is another fantastic place as well. Hadrian's Villa and yeah. the Villa d'Este Tivoli are also like a fantastic day out. Yeah, I mean, you could easily populate a couple of weeks, but we'd have to thin of like- And I've got a great restaurant there as well. <laughs> oh, I think <laughs> we need to know the great restaurant. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> We're gonna have to do this. So yeah, there's just so many things to do. And I think that this is what I think, those of you listening, what Agnes and I be beseech you to think about is how can you do Rome more appropriately for yourself how can you do Rome in a way that is enjoyable at any time of the year? And by the way, one of the things that I think people always say to me is, oh, I would never go to Rome in like 
July or August. August would be terrible. I'd never go to Rome. And I, I have my own opinion. You might disagree with me. I think August is a fantastic time to go because it's empty. Quite There's agree. Great <laughs> I quite agree. Um, yeah. And also, also, I mean, you know, we all have logistical concerns to think about. Um, you know, the reason why uh, perhaps people travel in July and August is because their children are on holiday from school and that's something that they can do. Um, I Again, I would say there's no bad time to come. They're just bad ways of doing it. My advice for a, a summer visit, an early start, a relaxing lunch, a bit of time in air conditioning, darkened room in the hotel or the apartment with the shutters closed and a snooze, and then back out again later in the afternoon. Yep. Don't do, don't do anything at three o'clock in the afternoon in July because it will be horrible. Have a nap. And but then take a break the then. You get two days for the price of one. You'll probably see more, but you'll feel like you've not been pounded to the ground. The other thing is Rome is not far from the coast. If you go to Ostia Antica in the morning, take the local train to the end of the line. It's not the finest beach in the Mediterranean, but it's fine. You have a plate of spaghetti and clams lounge under a sun uh, umbrella and, um, you know, have a swim. Um, and that's also uh, a nice thing to do. In fact, I'm, I mean, a couple of years ago, must be more now, before COVID, I was with, um, <laughs> Who can say? <laughs> uh, I was with clients uh, at Cerveteri and we went and had lunch at the beach after we'd done the tunes. And I'd suggested, they had two uh, sort of 10, 11 year old boys. I suggested that they brought their swimming costumes with them. And so the boys had a swim. Um, and, you know, that's a perfect uh, uh, addition uh, uh, to a, uh, a day out. Uh, Italian beach is also quite well equipped. I mean, one pays for, you know, a sunbed or an um, umbrella, but there are showers and places to get changed. You don't have to crunch your way all salty back into town. It's, a, it's quite civilised. Wow, that sounds really nice. And, you know, this is why Rome is where I eventually am planning to have my final my final home I'm going to move there eventually because I love the fact that Rome has everything you can go to the beach easily you can go to the mountains easily you can go to the countryside there's basically almost every kind of geological thing you want to see or landscape you want to see within a couple of hours of Rome without a problem absolutely it's wonderfully varied on a on a very warm day in um oh I don't know late March, you can ski in the mountains in the morning and swim in the sea in the afternoon if you're feeling particularly brave. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful way to be. So, you know, one of the main questions I get from people who are interested in going to Rome is what area to stay in. And everybody has a different opinion on this. As you mentioned, I like to stay when I'm there with my tour guests uh, in the Foro Boario. So that's kind of near the Circus Maximus. That's I like that because it's really quiet. It's like this funny funky little neighborhood where they're just, there are very few hotels, but there's also no people. Uh, what are your favorite areas of town to stay in? So I think that's a wonderful area because that's extremely close to everything, everything. while having that slightly removed feel. Yeah. Um, another area I like for that slightly removed feel, the Aventine Hill. There are only a couple of hotels up there, but I'm sure there are plenty of apartments for rent because that's a sort of leafy, beautiful area but it's very close to for example Testaccio yep. which is perfect for going out for supper lots of nice restaurants and a proper neighborhood vibe but also the other side is the Circus Maximus where Bruce Springsteen was playing on Sunday um, which is right by you know the Forum the Palatine Hill the Colosseum so that's a really nice kind of quiet central area alternatively the Field of Mars, the Campus Martius, Piazza di Spagna, uh, Piazza Navona, uh, Campo dei Fiori. I would say don't stay on Campo dei Fiori. You won't sleep. <laughs> you, will, you will never sleep. It's, um, there are lots of bars. There are lots of excitable young people having fun. And good luck to them. But uh, one doesn't want to necessarily hear it. Did um, I ever tell you, Agnes, I lived in an apartment on Campo dei Fiori in college that was like the top of like a seven floor, six floor building. <laughs> yeah, I moved out after being there a month because I never slept. Yeah, I would say definitely, for example, you know, if you're right on Piazza Navona, fine. That's not a noisy, rowdy square in the evening. Piazza di Spagna, that's not noisy and rowdy in the evening. Campo dei Fiori is. 
Um, but I would say those areas, the Pantheon, um, you know, there are a number of hotels around there and, and the Trevi Fountain. I mean, all of those areas, the Trevi Fountain, I mean, perhaps is a little bit too crowded all the time because, because the roads are tight. But I would definitely say that's, you know, if you're visiting Rome for a, a short period of time or for the first time, I would say a smaller road off a main drag, but in that area, yeah. or on one of those elegant piazzas, which is nice and quiet. Um, I would say that's wonderful. And also because when we're staying right there, you know, wake up in the morning, pop out, go for a quick walk before you have breakfast. Because you see the Spanish steps at even 8.30 in the morning. You There's don't have nobody. crazy early. Yeah. 8.30 in the morning or 11 o'clock is a totally yeah. different experience. And it's magical in the morning. Yeah. It's yeah, also we... magical walking back home in the evening. So I would definitely say, and also the, the other thing, sorry to butt in, but uh, the yeah. other thing is that um, uh, if you're staying in those really central areas, you can go out for a bit, pop back, have a bit of a relax. If it's hot, take a shower, have a bit of a lie down, while feeling that you're still in the middle of it all. And I think that's a nice thing uh, to do. So I would say, yes, if someone was staying in Rome for six months, I might suggest a different area. But I would say I would focus on the central areas if it's uh, a relative, you know, a normal sort of length visit. Yeah, but I, I think it is nice as well. It is. I think that the, your point is absolutely correct because I stayed at a hotel just adjacent to the Pantheon recently and I would never stay there, but we ended up at this Marriott and it was really like using points. It was really nice. I mean, I guess it wasn't like the kind of hotel I normally stay at, but what was amazing was we got up in the morning and we had breakfast with a room that looked at the, the roof of the Pantheon. And then I thought, wait a second, it's 730 in the morning. I'm going to go take pictures. And I went outside and there was nobody, nobody in front of the Pantheon. And I did that too. And we used to stay up near um, the Spanish steps. I'd get up at like 630 and just go for a quick stroll down the street from our hotel and take pictures because there's nobody there. No, I mean, Rome, people don't realize Rome doesn't really wake up until like nine. Well, this is a sort of central Rome doesn't. The rest of yes. Rome is bustling at seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, my local butcher is open at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, whereas on the Piazza Navona, you can't find a cup of coffee before 9.30. Uh, so yeah, the so Romans get up early. It's just there aren't very many Romans in the center of Rome, unfortunately. Um, first thing in the morning. But I mean, if you go to Piazza Santa Eustachio, my favorite coffee shop there, it's not the famous one, but the other one. Um, and that's Interesting. Sort of, uh, yeah, that's uh, Cafe Cafe. They're from Salerno. It's a that's a controversial coffee. opinion. I have to I have to tell you. Uh, Santa Eustachio puts sugar automatically in their in their coffee, which I'm not wild about. Um, oh. But uh, it's a question of opinion. Question of opinion. They're both really good. But anyway, San, um, Cafe Cafe is the one that uh, has the uh, uh, the binman and the policeman and the fireman and the um, civil servants from the Senate. Um, you know, so if you go, you know, if you need a coffee in the centre of town, the places where those, uh, you know, folk doing their day-to-day -day work congregate are the places to go because uh, uh, because Romans go and have coffee at the bar at 7.30 in the morning and uh, lots of places in the centre aren't necessarily open at that time. You know, my favourite bar in Rome, can you guess which my favourite bar in Rome is? Uh, Tazzadoro. No. I like Bar Farnese. Ah, <laughs> Bar Farnese is wonderful with the Signor Angelo. Yeah. The, um, uh, Mr. Angelo is the owner and the barber. And he with this um, uh, very elegant, always wears a bow tie. And he is of an uncertain age. He's been exactly the same age all the time I've lived in Rome, which is 23 yes. years. Yep. He is the most delightful, nicest mannered gentleman you'll ever come across. And that bar is one that I often, when I start tours at Campo di Fiori, I often stop off there. And I've come across all kinds of Italian actors. So, um, really? uh, you know, absolutely. It's uh, it's a kind of cult bar. So it's uh, yeah. it's a very good choice. And he makes me a uh, spremuta di arancia. I mean, not just for me, he makes it for anybody who asks. But uh, um, when I go there, I have a spremuta di arancia with the oranges uh, freshly squeezed. 
Um, and it's a slightly tiresome thing to do, and he never bats an eyelid about it, you know. So he's, even if he's very busy, he's delighted to make the spring with us. It's I love doing that for coffee or for an aperitivo just because it's like to just set the scene for those of you that have never been to this bar. It's really close to where she's sitting right now. If you just kind of go behind her and take a, a right, basically, well, no. and you go down the street, it's right there. It's amidst all these super touristy shops. But I, of course, am old. So I remember that area from like the mid 90s. And in the mid 90s, it was all family shops, butchers. There's a, There was a really great rusticeria, which unfortunately is some tacky something, something now. So it's, it used to not be all kind of glitzy and touristy. It was just kind of a local place. And Bar Farnese was one of the kind of like anchors of the neighborhood. And it's the same, like they have the same wood paneling, like from 1965. And the people working there are the same people I remember from when I was in college. And, and the, the price list has those sort of popper letters, the, numbers, the plastic yeah, yeah. ones that stick in to a kind of Which grid. Every bar had, um, every bar used yes. to have that. <laughs> no, exactly. It's, it's very good. Anyway, it's been an absolute delight to talk to you. I'm going to have to be a runner because I have a, a meeting with a friend uh, around the corner at another excellent bar that I can recommend, Bar Peru. All right. Just around here. But, I don't um, know that one. Ah, Bar Peru is good. It's where all the people from the um, archaeological library of Palazzo Farnese go. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Agnes, for joining us. So uh, for those of you who just joined us late, this is Agnes Crawford, and she's a local guide in Rome. She does excellent tours. You can find her at understandingrome.com, which I think is a very direct and easy thing to remember. And she also has a lovely podcast and a Substack, So you should check those out. You can find free episodes of her podcast on the previous post to this on Facebook. Those of you listening in podcast form, how can you find her podcast? Are you on... Um, on Apple um, at the moment it's just mm. on sub it's just on Substack. i'm afraid oh. I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a novice about these sorts of things so at the moment it's just yeah understandingrome.substack.com there you go that's how you can find her and hopefully i will see you very soon agnes at least for an aperitivo <laughs> absolutely thank you so much um thanks everybody for joining and um buona giornata have a lovely day or a lovely evening wherever you find yourself yes thanks and we'll much. see you in rome soon Ciao. Cheers. Bye -bye. It's a pleasure.